Okay, we are live this morning, and I see our our friend from Tallahassee, Buddy, is already um, joining us. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to today's virtual plant clinic without Dr. Bill Lester. <laughs> he had a meeting he had to attend in Citra, um, which has a... Uh, help me out, Bernie, a research center <laughs> in, in Citra, the University of Florida Research Center. Um, and uh, they just decided to hold a meeting for the extension agents there, of course, this morning. So uh, last week, while we were still recording, Dr. Lester informed me he would <laughs> not be here. You see, he does these things, you know, when he knows I'll have to be nice to him because <laughs> we're being recorded. Anyway, so because I get to be the host, I invited my co-host, uh, Mr. Bernard Bathauer, has come to join us this morning. Welcome, Bernie. Thank you. Great Thank to be you. here. Yes. We could be really, really formal this morning. We could be, you know, Bernard and Lillian. Bernard and Lillian are here to discuss the French Renaissance gardens of the 1760s. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not. Maybe we won't do that, huh? Actually, I was having a great discussion with Bernie before we went live, and he is very eager. Um, this has been on his mind a lot since in the past couple of weeks since we have had um, storms visit our state. And, you know, for those of us in West Central Florida. We fared very well. Basically, nothing happened here. Um, um, but, you know, that was not the case for people to our south. Good morning, Basem. People from Sarasota, you know, down through Naples, they experienced a extremely, um, you know, a bad, bad storm. And it's going to take years of recovery I'm going to take you know years of recovery for the human factor and then all the litter litter by i mean you know like boats and cars and you know things that the storm strewed around a lot of cleanup but what bernie's already thinking about is the environmental impacts of these storms and you know they are um you know there's a lot of them that's very impactful. So what were you sharing with me, Bernie? Good morning, Monique. Are you back in town? <laughs> Did you have a nice time in the mountains? <laughs> um, Bernie's going to share with us some of the thoughts that he has had regarding the coastal impacts of Hurricane Ian. Bernie? Okay. Yeah, th this goes back um, 20,000 years ago at the end of the Ice Age. Uh, the west coast of Florida was more than 100 miles farther west than it is now. There are Indian uh, ruins that are 60, 80 miles offshore underwater. And the, so over the past 6,000 years, uh, the, the west coast has, has moved inland uh, quite a bit. And the, the thing that, that happens is that the coast here in, in Hernando is a, a very calm coast. It's not what's considered an active coast. So it, mm -hmm. it's at a nice shallow angle. And as, as things come up, uh, the, the plant community moves back. And, and normally we have reeds along the edge. Uh, we have some grasses behind the reeds. Uh, we have uh, some plants that uh, are salt tolerant that are in the soil that are, is above the, the water line. Uh, we have uh, miles of marshes. Yes. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, the sable palms, the cabbage palms. Uh, and, and when I moved to the area 35 years ago, if you drove down Shoalwine Boulevard between Shoalwine and, and the Gulf, 
there were lots and lots of cabbage palms and, and everything was fine and they were in the dry. Well, over 35 years, the, the sea level has risen not very much, only in inches, but it's killed the cabbage palms. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing about it is because we've built houses and we've built roads and, and we've built natural barriers along the coast, this, this natural progression of, of the reeds, the grasses, the, 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 the plant communities that are there now uh, is stopping. We're, we're losing uh, our, our entire native community. The, these things, and, it, and it's happening in, in a time span that we don't normally think about it. it we're, we're looking at uh, maybe it moves a mile inland in a thousand years well um, you know 50 feet in a year or 25 feet in a year something like that you don't even notice it and it, if it's slower than that we're probably really realistically uh maybe five feet in 10 years so, so that mm -hmm. uh, it's very slowly progressing but it's but it is inevitably progressing and this community is, is important. It, it takes care of feeding a lot of little critters that are important in the water. Those little critters that are in the, the, the reed section uh, are feeding little things that are feeding little fish, that are feeding bigger fish. And uh, we have oysters. Well, we, we, sh we should have oysters here, but the, the community uh, the, that's here is not healthy enough to provide a, a good ground for oysters. Right, and, Brittany is working on trying to renew the oyster population so, here, yes. So as, as things happen, we, we come in and, and we, we build and we don't think of, of long term. You know, if, if, <laughs> if you look into the future and, and I can do this and it's gonna last 50 years, that's my lifetime. And, and, I'll have, and there are all those who um, benefit financially from, you know, that. So it's all very nearsighted. Give me the money, you know, for my lifetime or give me the beautiful view that this home provides for my lifetime. Yes. Well, that's, that's true. So if, if we have a situation where uh, I only think of, of in terms of maybe even going out a full hundred years, uh, before any damage, uh, any appreciable damage starts, uh, what we've done is that in order to satisfy ourselves, we've sacrificed our great grandchildren or our great great grandchildren. They get to pay the bill, and and it's totally unfair. And and we we have done that on both coasts, and we've done it for so long, it, it's become a nightmare. If if you uh, Look at what we're doing going through the, the green swamp right now. Lily was, was talking about uh, the construction that they've done in the green swamp to uh, add the second pair of lanes to Highway 50. Well, I'm, I agree that that's important that it be done. But uh, when, you, when you look at the money that they spend, they can only do it in a particular manner. What we're going to do is fill the swamp all the way across the green swamp. Well, yeah, which is what I was mentioning that they're just building the road up. And it looks to me, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a, you know, stormwater expert, but it looks to me like, you know, they're putting just a road that they have to build up through the swamp, therefore damming the swamp. And my question is, why aren't they building causeways, you know, little bridges that allow the flow to go through? Well, the, the thing about it is that costs a lot of money and I'm, we would have to pay for it. And if we do it this way, we don't pay for it. But there again, our great grandkids will pay for it. Uh, there, there's one spot out there that was so wet, they, they put in a, a dam and, and pumped the water over the dam into another part of the swamp. And they pumped for days until they got it dry enough that they could one, get their equipment unstuck and two, start filling it in. And they have filled it in now and it's high and dry. Well, uh, there are things that, that live in that. Uh, well, there and there are some immediate um, consequences. 
you know, that water has got to go somewhere. <laughs> so, you know, people who have never flooded before may end up flooding. And usually what happens is that ends up being the lower income folks who <laughs> suffer those consequences. Well, then, when the same thing, the, the, the water systems for a bunch of communities depend on that. The, the, the Wiklikuchi River starts there. Mm -hmm. The Hillsborough River starts there. Um, so but, you know, we don't know. Maybe they've done their engineering studies and they've got it all worked out. I, I mean, you know, all I do is yeah. drive over it and wonder. <laughs> so, it's after, If it was engineered by the same people doing the toll roads, it would make you wonder. But, I, I, I'm probably going to catch heck for that. So. You're the volunteer. I'm the one trying to be very. Yeah. <laughs> I, so that, that I, had, I really understand both sides on all this. It's just, uh, you know, sometime we're going to have to decide, do we want to keep pouring people into the state and, and destroying more and more of the state? Or do we want to try and keep uh, as much of the state as we can and and if you if you're here you want to stop people from doing things and if you want to come here you want the state as open as possible well those are two conflicting problems two conflicting opinions and uh, well, there, there has to be some middle ground Un unfortunately nobody wants to do the middle ground it's it's just like it is in all politics there's a group on one side, there's a group on the other side, and uh, we've mm -hmm. lost the ability to, to reach across the middle ground and, and say, come over and let, let's actually work this out. But um, eventually, these, these problems, these coastal problems are, are going to be really bad. We're going to have serious problems on the East Coast because you cannot stop the, the natural progression. They, they found out that when you put in the, the, the rip rack to uh, stop the beaches from washing away, that it causes the beaches to wash away in a different area. Uh, what about the, where they, they build up, or um, somewhere else? What about where they build up sand dunes and they plant like the beach sunflower and the sea oats and stuff? Um, no, I always thought that was done to help mitigate storm damage you know for the houses communities behind it does that work or does that also cause um, consequential problems down the line the the thing that, that happens is that all those things slow it down but none of the things are a permanent solution it it's it's like the, the places in england where uh, the water is, is lapped up against the coast for so many years that, that the mountain finally gives away the, the big cliff and the house on top of the cliff that has sat there for a thousand years and, yeah. and it has been a fantastic, beautiful sight for somebody is now gone. And, you know, I don't object to that. that that's fine if, mm -hmm. if the people are, are willing to realize that this house I built is, is, is transitory and, mm -hmm. and when when nature takes this property, uh, I don't mind that it takes the property. Unfortunately, what happens is they they spend a tremendous amount of somebody else's money to, to stop that from happening, and, and they never are satisfied with the fact that they got to enjoy it for all those years. And um, Life is transitory, Bernie. What well, is? And, yeah. and people need to realize that. What, what shouldn't be transitory, though, is what we're doing to the uh, environment as far as uh, we're, we're damaging our plant community. We, we have a fantastic plant community here. You were, you were giving me the numbers on the yeah, native I'll read that plants. A bit. Yeah. And, and native plants are, are really a pretty thing. We've, we've got beautiful flowers. We've, we've got... Uh, some really terrible things, but I'm sure they have a, a good purpose. Um, the vines that, that climb all over the trees that are native, uh, mm -hmm. the green briar, eat you alive trying to get rid of it. Uh, but still, it's, it's a pretty thing, and it's here, and it's been here for a long, long time, and it, it uh, isn't hurting anything except people. 
Right. And we have to, we have to learn that uh, people are not the only thing. If if you uh, do everything based strictly on what it does to people and not what it does uh, to the, the natural system, that's pretty selfish. Because it's going to circle around. We are part of the natural system. We may believe ourselves to be at the top of it or above it, but everything we do to harm the environment is going to harm us because we are part of the environment. I mean, it really just makes sense when you sit and think about it. But on the other hand, what I always say is we all want development to stop, particularly here in Florida. We all want it to stop as soon as our house is built. You know, we all make an impact. Some point or another, every human being has had to build their own habitat and they disturb some something else's in the process thereof. So what Florida Friendly Landscaping does is try to mitigate <laughs> that crime you committed by building your house and, you know, and, and make it up to the rest of nature. Um, the numbers you were talking about, I got it off of the Florida Wildflower Foundation's Facebook page. They presented an interesting um, infographic here. Florida native plants by the numbers. We have 3,200 native plants. That would be species, not just plants, but species. And I'm sure it's not a round number, you know, exactly like that. They're, they're just giving round numbers, 3,200 native species of plants, 230 endemic plants. What does endemic mean, Bernie? It means that uh, they're found here and nowhere else. Right. 170 endemic wildflowers. I mean, they, they only grow in Florida. Of those 3,200 native plants, 566 are threatened and endangered. What is that percentage wise? You do the math, Bernie. I don't do <laughs> you know, what, what's really funny, I, I'm, I'm not uh, normally an environmentalist. I, I only bring these things up uh, at this time because, of, you know, with the hurricanes going through, we're, we're, we're in a position to really think about what needs to be done to rebuild and to rebuild so that it is uh, environmentally long-term uh, for everybody's best interest. But uh, the, the native plant thing, I'm, I, I hate Biden's alba. That, that to me, that's probably one of the worst plants that exists. But I realize that it serves a purpose. It's one of the, the great butterfly plants. Uh, is pioneering. It, it's there everywhere. Uh, it uh, is, is one of the first things to show up, and, and it definitely provides uh, a starting point uh, in the environment to, to maintain the, the wildlife. So it, it's probably a good plant. Uh, I don't like it in my yard. I do everything I can to get rid of it, which is never I mean, successful. You know, it can be annoying because it's aggressive. And it puts those little stickers all over you. But well, when you go out there and it is constantly covered in pollinators, you know, so I have a love-hate relationship with it. So some somebody needs to think about the the, the what is the, the value of this um, before we just tend to wipe it out and eliminate it. And, and we have that, that problem with, with so many plants. Uh, uh, you go in and, and you build an entire community, you take out every native plant, you put in landscaping that uh, totally ignores the, the situation that was there before, and thousands of acres that were available to a lot of Florida things other than just people uh, suddenly uh, disappear. Uh, the, the pollinators don't get what they need. Uh, the raccoons don't get what they need. Uh, the possums don't get what they need. The deer don't get what they need. And, and that's okay if, if you really feel like those things need to disappear. But it, if you feel like that uh, for Florida to stay Florida, uh, you, you need a well-rounded community of things. 
but at least take some of this stuff into to consideration before you bring the bulldozer in and scrape away the entire community. So where'd you go to, Willie? Hmm. Oh, you know, this is a, a great time to think about uh, planting some winter flowers. Uh, a lot of things that uh, you could stick in the ground right now. Uh, th this is the month to do it. Uh, Elysium, ba baby's breath, uh, Dianthus, Dusty Miller. I like those. They're, they're pretty. Uh, it's a little early for pansies, but it's it's late for petunias. Snapdragons are good this time of year. So if you, if you put those things in, add a little color. Uh, the, the late insects will enjoy it, the late pollinators, and uh, I don't have a clue what we're we'll doing here. Well, I have lost. Dave, are you coming back, Lily? I'm nope. trying. Okay. You leaned on the keyboard and shut yourself off. I, I love these technical things. I'm an electronics technician, and, and I, I understand how computers work, but I don't understand the programming part of it. So uh, I, I think it's uh, just hilarious that all these things happen to people uh, from from the computers because they are not user friendly. I was from an era where things had knobs and, and tubes and they were happy and they warmed up and you adjusted something. Am I done? Yeah, no, you're still I'm, I'm still there. Okay. Keep going. All right. I was seeing if anybody had any questions or if there's any. You see I, I don't. Questions. I don't get the. Uh, oh, question. Okay. Okay. Oh, I lost my train of thought there. She wanted to know if, if anybody had questions that, that we could answer for them, and uh, probably not. I'm I'm one of those people that uh, I have a lot of answers. Unfortunately, not to. Uh, particular questions that you may have. So uh, if, if you want to know something that's pretty much useless, I am the man of useless information. Good time to uh, get your winter vegetable garden. In fact, it, it's getting a little late. Uh, you really need to get those, those things in. Uh, if, if you grow cauliflower, that, that's one of those things I, I've always Thought was kind of neat because you have to cover the heads, uh, pull the leaves up, and, and cover them so that they, they turn white. It's too much problem. I uh, reached the, the stage in my life where I quit gardening because I bend over and get down to uh, work on the plants and I can't get back up. So uh, I, I admire people that are uh, in their 70s, 80s. You've got a couple of little, little old ladies in their 90s that can still uh, do those things but uh, unfortunately i'm not one of them anymore so when when it comes to straight gardening i'm i'm uh, pretty much done there there's a technique oh let's see in my opinion then so we'll be hit with another storm yeah unfortunately we're going to uh have way too many of those storms tear things up. You know, you know the, the the east coast of Florida is a classic. We have more miles of, of those little uh, islands, little uh, shelter islands than, than any other state. And unfortunately, they, they tend to move and, and We've got people living on them. So uh, in, in the next thousand years, when all that moves, they're going to be very disappointed. But the people that are there now are going to be very happy. This, this is uh, kind of a, a situation where you're, you're in one of the best states uh, you could possibly be in. We, ha we have great temperatures, uh, the ability to... Uh, go in where it's air conditioned if you think it's too hot uh, we have the evenings are almost always really nice uh, it, it's sunny we have 
enough of our wildlife left though there's still wild florida and you can go to a lot of parks and and there is a lot of lands that has been set aside the thing that we need to make sure happens is that that land stays set aside hmm. can you hear me bernie i can hear you okay so it's just a matter of <laughs> i'm invisible okay and I've heard you through the whole thing. That is what's odd. And I really didn't do anything with my camera. And no, it's not your fault. Um, I think something was happening with with my camera to begin with is why you only saw half of my background. So I hadn't touched it. But you're doing a great job there, Bernie. <laughs> you know, I, I've always wondered what happens if you're on a talk show and your guest doesn't show up. And, and <laughs> how do you fill the time? And surprisingly, if, if you're used to saying a lot and not saying anything at the same time, you can do this. It's Just, oh, yeah, you're, you did a fantastic job. You didn't let anything uh, get in your way or, or anything. So, I. Well, I, I think that uh, we should probably uh, get a group together and, and go to the state and, and and push for more gardening in the state i don't you know if, if we want to garden and, and we want things to grow and we want uh, a really great uh, place for gardeners to go move, come to get them to pass a law that everybody that moves to the state has to take a master gardener class to wow. at least understand how to do it right off the bat <laughs> <sighs> That, that, yeah, I'm not sure we can get that uh, accomplished. Oh, you go. Well, I think we need more master gardeners. We do, but as far as making a law for it, I don't know. Well, if, if that done. would slow down the, uh, the amount of people moving to the state, and it would make sure that the people that move to the state would then become uh, 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 more in favor of maintaining the state as it is. I, I I really love it here. I, I like I say we we moved here about thirty five years ago now, and and I do not regret one minute of it. I I have enjoyed everything about this place. It, it, it's just uh, wonderful. And and I didn't garden until we moved to Florida. I had a lot of trouble when I first started. I I, I would plant things and watch them die, and I would plant more things and watch them die. Oh man! Oh, you're back. Yay! <laughs> and uh, took took a class at the extension, and and they explained that the plants have to grow in a particular spot, and that if you put it in the wrong spot, that it wouldn't grow. Well, that's one of the the things now in in the Florida friendly right plant right place. Well, absolutely yes. When and we you... bought something, if we'd watch it, and if it wasn't healthy and wasn't doing well, we would move it. And if it didn't do well there, we would move it again. And each time we would move it to a different yeah. environment. And, and we found that we could pretty well get most plants to survive if, if we moved them often enough. Well, then I, I took a, a class and they, they uh, passed out uh, the plant guide that is now a big fancy book. But the, that original plant guide Oh, yeah, it had a lily on the front of it, remember? It, it said that a plant would grow under these conditions, and it was accurate. It wasn't, wasn't a super guide in that it, it wasn't all-inclusive, but it was very, very accurate. And, and I started buying only plants that were in the guide, and, and things started clicking. And at that point, I thought this was fun. I started and actually enjoyed gardening. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the same way with vegetables. When you move here from up north, uh, about May, you want to go plant your tomato seeds. Well, that, that's way too late. But, you know, that, that's what you're used to. Now, you just go buy some transplants in uh, February, put them in the ground in February, and, and it feels so wrong, and it works. So... There, there's there's an education that is available to people from the university. Every every plant that, that 
uh, has any popularity at all, has some university information available, and you can access it simply by typing in the name of whatever you're interested in, add the letters you at, yep. and, and if there is anything, it comes back with gorgeous information. And, and your land grant university, wherever yeah. your state is, and here I mean, we've, we've paid for it, we yeah. should be taking advantage of it. Um, right, and but they also are paying for it with our taxes, but they are giving you research based information. They're not trying to sell you, you know, anything. Mm -hmm. Teresa wants to know what about planting more mangroves. Um, I have a question. There's some confusion rolling around in my mind, Ernie. Maybe you can help me with it. I have seen recently comments, um, maybe even in some publications and things, that's throwing me off and confusing me, referring to some of the mangroves as invasive. <laughs> so well, I, I, I think that would be true uh, in very certain conditions. Is it, you know, the, the basically there's three kinds of mangroves growing in the state and, and each one has a specific, specific place and, and they all help maintain the, the, the waterfront. And if, if you have the, the wrong one, uh, if, you, if you plant them and, and misplace, they, they will not provide the protection to the waterfront that standard mangroves do. Mangroves are a wonderful plant in that uh, the, the way the root structure is, uh, it, it becomes uh, a, a nesting ground for lots and lots of things. A, a mangrove swamp uh, is, is probably as productive an area as you can get. Uh, it's an estuary, yes. The, the, the disadvantage to mangroves in a community where you have a lot of people is that the mangroves block the view and and people are, are very funny you know i i paid a million dollars for this lot i want to be able to see something other than mangroves and uh, yeah. a lot of times they'll illegally go out and trim them but uh, are there any non-native mangroves they're all native aren't they uh i think there is some non-natives oh okay the, maybe the, that's where the issue is and you're right so that all just goes back to the first principle of florida friendly landscaping which is right plant right place maybe if you put um one of the non-natives or you put a black native or i mean a black mangrove or a red mangrove should be you know it grows out of control uh, i guess it's one of those things that re you have to really know what you're doing but they are an extremely important plant to our environment. Like you said, they create estuaries, they create wildlife sanctuaries above and below, and they also help with storm mitigation and coastal protection. Um, Buddy has a question here for you. Ernie, what good are noceums? <laughs> and that's in general. You don't know. Um, I would say they're a food source for something. You know, everything is a food source for 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 something else. Um, that's a very good question. Just gnats in general we'll have to look up some point. What benefits do gnats <laughs> provide? Um, no seams. No seams. Yes. I I I think they are native. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as do they serve a good purpose? Yes, only the no they keep humans off the coast, <laughs> so the coast can be left alone. <laughs> there, there are animals that eat them. Yes. So, uh, from that standpoint, they're 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 a niche in the food chain. Mm -hmm. um, could we do without them? Um, probably but i don't think that we would i i i feel like that that's one of those insects that feeds enough other things 
that if you actually took them out totally, that mm -hmm. uh, it would alter the, the community. And there, there are things where that happens that, that you end up altering a community and, and, and don't realize what the linchpin was. You know, the, mm -hmm. It's like if, if you get rid of the gopher tortoises, the, the, the gopher tortoises on their own probably wouldn't, wouldn't make that much difference. But then you would start losing other things. Yeah, because uh, they're a keystone you lose a gopher frog. And if you lose a gopher frog, you probably have a little increase in some insect. You would have a little decrease in something else. And eventually, it would start affecting the snake population. And, and it would just alter uh, dramatically. Uh, we're talking mm -hmm. about the, these plants along the, the coast. Uh, the, the plant that stabilizes the dunes it really is an important plant. The sea oats. And, mm -hmm. and the reason sea oats are so important is that the, the dunes are sitting there and, and the normal conditions, the sand blows up on the dune and, and it covers the plants and it kills the plants. Well, sea oats, as the sand builds up, put out more roots and grow taller and put out more roots. The, is that you you bring the, the sand up on the stem and the stem just produces roots from the stem and and it keeps increasing the amount of root structure and, and really holds the dunes together so if, if you drive a um, dune buggy or something across the dunes and you take out a strip of, of sea oats you almost always get some erosion in that point. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very important plant. And it's against the law to disturb them. And and uh, same way with, with the sea grasses. The, the sea grasses uh, are a, a stabilizing influence and, and the, the nursery grounds for just about everything. So if, if you go through with your propeller and you chop them up on your, from your boat, uh, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. There, there are a handful of things that, that become super, super critical to the, the community. And, and if you lose them, you lose something terrible in the community and, and you don't necessarily associate it. It's, it's like planting a, a tree. If, if, if you put the tree in a hole, it is totally filled with, with good stuff. You, you fertilized, you've added some really wonderful things you put the tree in the roots are so happy they go round and round and round in the uh, nice little bed you've created they don't go out into the, the mm -hmm. soil that they're going to have to live in and eventually they've circled the plant the roots get big they strangle the plant the plant dies and four years later when it dies you don't understand that it died because of what you did when you planted it you and treated it too well plant. Yeah. If, if you take out the noceums, uh, they, they probably don't do much uh, in the community as long as they're there, but they may do something terrible to the community when they're gone. The, the bats that fly along the water's edge, some bird that eats those things or some bird that eats what eats them, uh, it, you, you just don't know for sure what you're going to lose. So. The, the less damage you can do, the best. The yep, best. The, the creator knows what they were doing. We're the ones who don't understand how all the pieces fit together there. Now we have a question a little bit um, away from the coast. Here's a good question for you, Bosem wants to know, can we grow olives in central Florida? Yes. Works, works in, okay. That's uh, your surprise, That's your surprise to everybody. The <laughs> olives uh, normally grow in what's known as a Mediterranean climate, which is warm, low humidity. And and uh, what few attempts had, had been made earlier, uh, the high humidity was detrimental. And, and we felt for a long time that olives were not a good choice for Central Florida. Turns out there are varieties that do quite well here. Uh, what you have to realize with olives is that you can't eat what comes off the tree. The, the, the olives are a, a, 
don't know if fermented is the right word, but they're, they're a pickled thing. Uh, and it, it takes a long time to, to turn them into uh, eating olives. But uh, the, the olives that come off the tree are, are, are very good oil producers. And there, there are several people uh, in the community here that are, are growing olives and, and doing olive oil. And it works well. It's Yeah, I, I believe Bassem is in this local area. So, yeah, there are at least a couple, as Bernie mentioned, you can look up you know, olive groves in Hernando County and um, find out you can actually go purchase a tree. And um, I know at least one of them then would offer their press um, for when you actually, you know, have the fruiting olives, you can take it there to get it pressed, at least for oil. As Bernie said, I don't know if there's a system out there that where you go and, you know, turn them into edible olives, I'm sure, you know, they know how to do all that. I keep seeing the scene in The Godfather when <laughs> when they took the, the the young child to Sicily to show them him the olive operation, because that was their legitimate business. <laughs> but that, that's what I keep seeing. But yeah, apparently it can be done and pretty successfully here. Trees are beautiful. So. If yeah. You, if Monique is mentioning that gophers, I think she means gopher tortoises, are no longer on the endangered list. And that makes her angry. Um, <laughs> only 12% of their range were they actually really endangered. The feds had dropped them because of that. But in Florida, Georgia, um, most of Alabama, uh, it's not a problem. They're, um, actually endangered in a few areas in uh, Louisiana and in Mississippi. But I think other than that, it's I less have, than 12% of the range. I see quite a number of them, you know, where I live. I probably have, I don't know, at least three or four on my property. But, you know, it is a concern that um, all the development that's going on, and I'm not quite certain, there seems to be things shortcuts being taken because <laughs> i knew you know before you weren't allowed to clear cut a lot and now that seems to be done just absolutely clear cutting and putting a house and not necessarily replacing the trees or even just some of them and um i don't see a lot going on you know uh mitigating the gopher tortoises <laughs> I don't see, you know, them marking them and then having someone coming and get them before they build these houses. Maybe one I'm of the, it because one I'm, of the people I work with uh, says that they're, they taste even better than manatee. <laughs> All right, let's see. How do we mute Bernie? <laughs> You've done <laughs> such a great job <laughs> up to this point. Bernie's joking. <laughs> there is a culture of... Um, people who do, you know, it's been a long time history in their culture and in their families to, to eat gopher tortoises. And it is difficult to break that, that culture for them. But if they're doing it now, they're doing it illegally, uh, for sure. Teresa is, of course, showing us a publication. I'm not sure what that one was on, Teresa. We talked about several different things. Might be probably olives, probably growing olives. Uh, here she goes, olives for the home landscape. And there's a publication, as Bernie said, the easiest way to do that is right olives for Florida <laughs> UF in Google, and you will find this EDIS publication where you see that EDIS that just means electronic digital information system that the University of Florida, um, you know, there, there's where you can find thousands, thousands of publications on all kinds of subjects. Bernie and I have spent the last, what, 17 or so years <laughs> spending our days <laughs> reading these publications and, and learning. And a lot of times, not a lot of times, but every once in a while when I run out of ideas for a class, 
I'll start looking through these EDIS publications. And then and if it's not something I am very, very familiar with, I will literally make a presentation going down the publication, you know, and then presenting it with pretty pictures and, you know, maybe in, in simpler terms or something. So we rely on them a lot too. What does IFAS stand for? I don't know, Bernie, what does IFAS stand for? That's our Institute of Food and Agricultural Science. And everybody uh, comes around and they, they want to know why we are an IFAS Institute or an IFAS uh, extension and, instead of straight University of Florida. And uh, the IFAS is the Institute of Food and Agricultural Science. It's, you it's know what a, they call that in other states? What? The College of Agriculture. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> we are. Yes, that is just their fancy term for the College of Agriculture. And um, extension means, well, you want to tell that whole history for those who may not? We are the extension. It, it, you know, when you go up to the university, uh, IFAS incorporates uh, several labs that, that provide services to the community. We've, we've got the soil testing lab. Uh, we've got uh, a nematode lab, nematology school. Uh, we, we do uh, plant um, nutrient testing. Uh, we, we've got uh, research on uh, citrus going on. We have research on, on just about every kind of plant going and and the the university does things like uh, they, they will take a, a, a plant that, that has some commercial value and they'll grow it under 20 different systems uh, 20 different soil types that are found in in florida and and they come up with uh if, if your soil is this you need to do that to, to be successful with this this particular plant. So when when you send a soil sample in, and they come back with a recommendation, that recommendation is is based uh, not only on just the the pure science of soil, but it's based on the fact that they have run the test to know specifically that in Florida, under these conditions, this is what you need. And if you send a soil test from Florida to another state. You don't necessarily get the same recommendation back because they haven't tried it. Whereas the, the information that you get here is, is tried and true. It's, it's a wonderful thing. It, and, and now we have, uh, well, I, everybody should be aware that, that there's been a serious problem in, in the citrus industry. That there, there's a disease that has been killing the, the citrus plants like mad. And, uh, we, we finally got a, a citrus citrus green, green. Yes. That, that is resistant to uh, Hong Long Bing, which is... Hong, Hong Long Bing. Yes. Hong Long Bing is citrus yellow, green. Yes. It will leave uh, citrus <laughs> green. Uh, but anyway, now we, we have a, a, a plant called the Sugar Bell. And it, if you're planning on buying any citrus, uh, if you buy anything but a sugar bell, it'll probably get HLB and die. But uh, if, if you get the new uh, sugar bell, you can now have citrus again in your garden. And uh, it's a wonderful thing because we've had a lot of people for the past five years have been very upset with the fact that uh, they shouldn't really be doing much with uh, citrus. But try the sugar bell. Try, try something. The, the university has spent a lot of time uh, developing uh, to make life easier for a lot of people. Back to that graphic from um, the Wildflower Foundation. The last thing it says is Florida is the seventh most botanically diverse state in the contiguous U.S. I want to know what the six other states are because obviously Hawaii is not one of them because it says contiguous. So, I wonder, 
what is also more botanically diverse in Florida? I bet you Washington State might be one of them. Maybe yeah. Texas. Texas has got a lot of different areas. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. They've, they've got the dry lands, the coast lands. I bet some, California. Some like yeah. some swamp lands in the uh, eastern part of the state, some mountainous lands. So they've, they've got quite a bit. Well, there's some homework we can all do. Look up the most botanically diverse states <laughs> <laughs> in the United States. So you would think, I mean, I'm surprised that Florida is seven on the list. I thought it would be up in the top three. But well, I'm I, pretty sure Delaware is. That's what they named us. That's what Ponce de Leon named us. <laughs> Land of the flowers. And there's so many people who move here who say, what, Bernie? Nothing. Nothing grows in the sand. I had a wonderful garden up north and nothing grows here. This is nothing but sand and weeds and your grass looks like crab grass. And boy, I'm not happy at all. And to those people, you know, if you feel that way, that's- Okay, that's Bertie, 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 be careful. <laughs> no, no I'm, I'm, I'm going to be nice. The, the okay. truth is with little effort, you can produce about anything in this state. The, oh, okay. The, the sand, I was going to mention which direction I-95 went. <laughs> no, no, no. The, the, the sand is actually a, a good starting point. It, it's not necessarily the end where you, where you need to be, but uh, a little compost, a little hard work, uh, you can grow anything in Florida. You may not grow it at the same time you grew it up north, but it, it uh, for the most part, will grow here. There's a few things that won't. You don't you don't get lilacs for the same reason you don't get palm trees in Indiana. But uh, with with those kind of exceptions, for for most of the plants, uh, Florida is a great place to grow them. And uh, I have the, noticed a trend in the Pittsburgh area. So I'm assuming it's not just there, but that is where I have a lot of focus because I have family there and I'm originally from there. And I follow some photography groups from there. So what seems to be trendy is to put palm trees and very tropical type plants in their yards, sometimes in pots and then they bring them in or sometimes just like as annuals try and have that tropical look in a temperate area. So, you know, people are experimenting with different things. And I wonder, you know, they're experimenting and not incredibly failing. They know that it's a temporary thing. I wonder if, you know, the fact that it is getting warmer has something to do with that. Well, the problem is it, it hasn't gotten is much warmer there you know we're when they they talk about global warming they're talking about uh temperature changes of two degrees or less mm -hmm. so you know two yeah, degrees Cindy, i am referring to right in sometimes some of the photos are right in the city um that people are trying palm trees um i most of them are in plants but not necessarily my brother has a lot of like elephant ears and other very tropical things, but he knows they are going to, they're going to die and they use them as annuals or some of the bulb things they dig up, they put in their, you know, basement or in maybe in a little bit of a warmer area and plant them again in the spring. So. You, you can do that. If you really wanted the lilac tree in Florida, it's, it's possible, but it's not practical. And, uh, you know, um, there are uh, some uh, enclosed arboretum areas that grow uh, palm trees in the north, but uh, that, that's a horrendously expensive thing. Right, to, it's not what would be labeled Florida friendly or whatever their version may be in another state because it's high maintenance. And Florida friendly, um, it's called different things. They have different versions of it in different, states there is um 
Carolina Yards and Neighborhoods. Remember, it used to be Florida Yards and Neighborhoods. Carolina Yards and Neighborhoods, the Clemson took it right from UF <laughs> and, you know, kind of tailored it for themselves. Um, um, Tennessee Smart Yards, you know, I've heard of all, you know, and that I've looked into and they have almost the exact same nine principles. They just kind of word them differently and put them in a different order. Um, I'm not sure what Penn State, you know, if they have a, you know, probably something you would find under water wise landscaping or whatever. Um, but that's all based on low maintenance. So if you're going to get into the high maintenance hobby type planting, such as maybe like growing roses in Florida, <laughs> it can be done, but is not necessarily considered Florida friendly because Florida friendly is low inputs as well as low maintenance. Yes. And that's Cindy saying them wanting uh, tropicals is like her wanting tulips and daffodils. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We want what we can't have. Well, you can do it, but it's it's going to be a, a tremendous problem in air conditioning and, and uh, creating the environment. You know, if, if, if you wanted to do it indoors, uh, you you could do it if if you want to do it outdoors uh we just don't have the outdoor climate but that, that's like i said that's that's true of, of so many things you you give up uh the lilacs because you've got palm trees and uh, we we do have uh mm -hmm. flowers that grow so you here. give up the lilacs because you want to be warmer in the winter because um, I don't consider a palm tree for lilac a good trade. <laughs> on the other hand, what we forget, we remember, it stays in our mind, the good times stay in our minds. This, the wonderful aroma of that lilac stays in our mind. What doesn't stay in our mind is that aroma lasts two weeks, and the rest of the time that bush looks not fabulous. <laughs> So, yeah. the the other plant that that, they, that everybody seems to want is, is the evergreen type plants, and and almost none of those are very successful in Florida because of the the high temperature and the high humidity. Uh, they have a lot of fungal problems. Amaryllis is a, a nice choice. That's that's a great plant. Uh, mm -hmm. I just saw it pop up on the screen. Yep, yep, Cindy's yeah. and Pinellas. I, I, I really hate it when, when people uh, want these Christmas tree type plants. Uh, with the exception, we're, not, we're not doing fir trees here. No, with, with the exception of the, the uh, cedar tree, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's pretty hard. You know, you plant a cedar tree, it, it has that pyramid shape of, of a Christmas tree for about the first 10 years. Yeah. And, and then it changes shape and becomes a nightmare big tree but uh that's about the only I love my cedar trees they're not nightmares <laughs> well they are when when you were looking for that that pyramid that sure conical, that, the tree, yes but. conical shapes yes well you know um the world is smaller now so you can live here and then be like me who happens to go up north probably three to four times a year. So then, you know, walk by and stroke the, the nice uh, spruce trees and smell them and maybe get there when the lilacs are there and then run back here before it gets too, too much sleet comes <laughs> down on the ground. <laughs> uh, Do we have any last minute questions before we go? Um, yeah, amaryllis are one of the bulb plants that we can grow here. Them in daylilies and what canna lilies and um, ah, I lost the name of those leafy things that you can put under trees, caladium. <laughs> um, those are the the bulbs we can do here. Now there's a, there was supposed there was talk years ago of a Florida daffodil. Have you heard much about that? No. No. They must not have been all that successful. Sometimes they try things and 
I was told there used to be lots of long needle pine trees along the beach before building. Norfolk pine grow crazy tall here. What I think, and I heard this from Pinellas County because they did plant in Pinellas County, probably in the 20s or something. A whole lot of guess what, Bernie? Australian pine along the coastal areas. And that might be what you're hearing about. Actually, the the, the long way, the pine trees are a, a common behind the shore tree. Uh, in um, the eastern part of the, the state where things are pretty well defined, you have the, the dunes uh, and then uh, a little water behind the dunes and then uh, the, the uplands and the upland forest or the, the beginning of the forest. Pines uh, grow in that that section. So with they aren't a beech tree meaning right down on the beach, but they're a beech tree meaning that uh, they were usually like a half mile back or uh, maybe a quarter of a mile, depending on the, the particular beach. Um, she has a good point there, you see what she wrote. What, what we did was, there again, we would put roads along, and as things moved, we lost the pines. The, the roads blocked the natural evolution of the pines moving inland, and, and as things moved up, uh, the pines went away. Yeah, they did collect the sap. The the the, the turpentine. Turpentine industry. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called the marine stores industry, and that was a major industry, uh, even here in Hernando County. There there are still some trees. Uh, the uh, place where they they cut the face is called the cat face, and there's still some uh, cat face pine trees in Hernando County. So, mm -hmm. big industry. And she's talking about what well, they did. I know in Pinellas County, though, that put right on the beaches these Australian pines, which caused all kind of havoc, havoc and trouble. But people have good memories of taking picnics under them and all that. But those are an invasive exotic. They're very shallow rooted. They'll come down in a storm and tear up crocodile nests and sea turtle nests. The Norfolk pines. <laughs> Yeah, they do grow crazy tall and they come down, they come down in storms very easily as well. And they're, you know, kind of funky looking. They don't really, they can be a billion feet tall and not provide an ounce of shape. <laughs> they're pretty interesting. Speaking of trees coming down, uh, there, there were a lot of people this year that did hurricane cut on their palm trees. Oh no, yeah, we need to Yeah, that. my my neighbor did I almost cried. I, I couldn't talk her out of it. Uh, and and she really hacked them. Uh, I went over to um, the hospital um, day before yesterday and noticed that uh, their trees are really cut back. The the hurricane cut on palm trees actually reduces their ability to withstand hurricanes. Absolutely. If you look, every every, every yeah. time you do a hurricane cut, you end up with a weak spot in in the tree. So eventually, uh, the winds come through and and they snap off where you were doing hurricane cuts previously. the The palm trees are designed to withstand really big hurricanes. The the, the trees flex and and having the, the full size uh, canopy on the tree, the tree bends at just the right arc, doesn't really hurt the tree at all. Uh, doing a hurricane cut is a serious, serious error. And one of the counties on the East Coast, it's against the law to do that. You should if never cut the footage. footage. Yeah, if you look at the footage of Hurricane Ian, you know, you can see the palm trees. What are they doing? Just like you said, that arc, but they're doing this. And why are they doing that? You know, they're all, they're protecting that growing point, that one growing point, you know, at the tip of the palm tree. 
that's the job of those fronds is to protect that during the storms. You take the fronds away, you take away that protection and the damage could occur to the growing point. So if you do want to prune, if you don't like the brown skirt, if you're afraid it'll become projectiles, where do we prune at, Bernie? 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock. You leave that gumdrop part of the um, palm tree. You can prune under if you want. You don't have to. And if there's a spot of green on that frond, it's feeding that tree. Isn't that correct? That's correct. The, the um, palm trees grow by taking the nutrients out of the bottom fronds and putting it into the new growth. So as long as there's any green at all on the bottom row of fronds, they're, they're still feeding the new growth. Um, it, it's one of those things where the, the palm needs a certain canopy number of fronds uh, to maintain health the, when when they come up out of the ground they have their maximum diameter they will never get any bigger than, than what they are once the, the trunk is up out of the ground they're not trees nope. trees have a vascular system around the outside uh, just underneath the bark with the rest of the tree being inactive the the most most of the lumber inside the tree is not doing anything other than support just sitting there on a, a pine or not pine a palm uh, there are veins uh, uh, the, the uh, system is across the entire uh, diameter of, of the trunk so it, it in that sense it's more like a grass than it is a tree mm -hmm. if, if you uh, keep cutting the the fronds back, the, the trunk will get smaller in diameter. As it gets smaller in diameter, it becomes less and less strong. So uh, if, if you keep pruning it, you, you weaken it because you're taking away the nutrients that it needs to, to support the new growth. And second, if you keep cutting it, you will uh, reduce the diameter of the trunk and you will have a, a weaker, weaker palm. So Palms uh, are, are a unique plant. They, they require more care than most plants. They, they have very specialized fertilizer requirements, which nobody ever takes care of. And <laughs> they don't like it, it, it just makes me want to cry when I see a, yeah. a, a tree trimmer trailer go by filled with green fronds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just, if, if you know if, if you spend 20 bucks on a palm tree and you want to hack it up and it dies you know you're out 20 bucks but if if you buy a really nice palm tree and and you spend a lot of money doing all this stuff you you know you spend a couple thousand dollars on a palm you spend a couple thousand dollars doing this ridiculous stuff and it dies you're out a lot of money and it's it's your own fault so yeah. it, it's like everything else google your palm uf the information will come back uh, maybe uh, google pruning palm trees or fertilizing palm trees but learn about them uh, they they, uh, yep. Cindy they, says they are a very yeah. valuable commodity in your yard take care of it treat them well and 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 they live a long time they'll outlive you but uh, if you don't uh, they're a problem and Cindy says now she understands why some trunks are not a solid shape all the way up. Okay, well, we are over time. So as we leave, Bernie, um, let's see if we can get you, as we're leaving, let's do the Palm Hurricane Dance. Here we go. Come on. <laughs> Every, <laughs> say goodbye to everyone. <laughs> oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> we'll do a dance. Thank you, everyone, and have a great weekend. <laughs>